And the next session will be about agriculture and fish farming here in Gothenburg. So with us now we have a senior lecturer at Chalmers University of Technology, also at the University of Gothenburg, as well as lecturer at the Swedish Agriculture School. And we have here Mr. Niklas Wenberg, also the CEO and founder of Pond. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This one, yes. Yeah, uh, lecture at uh, Chalmers and the University. Normally I feel quite confident when I enter stage that it might not be quite as boring as the previous lecture, but today I'm a bit more nervous about that part. Uh, thanks Ericsson for inviting and thanks for, for uh, picking up the, the pace when it comes to corporate uh, sustainability engagement and thanks for the previous uh, uh, pres presentator and uh, for his ambitious work, really inspiring. Um, let's go from there. Uh, I like this setup, by the way. Uh, pictures all around, people all around. So, uh, I'm going to talk about urban agriculture and I will start in a sort of strange spot, but we'll go over from the strange part of Göteborg and history into uh, the main theme, which is urban fish farming combined with, with plants. And actually, this is a way to save the oceans. So referring to the one year ago UN Ocean uh, Conference, I was represented there with a solution to save oceans by working on land with urban fish farming. We'll get back to that. So urban aquaponics. Aquaponics is nothing new, fancy from Berlin or New York. It's old style producing a lot of food to a lot of people, mainly in Asia, pond culture, a lot of action in the pond and around the pond that made uh, uh, villages and cities thrive all over Asia and still does. So urban aquaponics, it's about saving oceans with uh, fresh water solutions. And uh, the, the main theme of aquaponics, it's when you produce one ton, 1,000 kilos of fish, you get nutrients for 10 tons, 10,000 kilos of plants. So instead of putting the nutrients in the water, in the ocean that doesn't want plastic or more nutrients, you build plant systems. And so it's about saving the ocean and it's about presenting food produced in Sweden instead of importing it from areas in the world where there actually is no fish. Oceans are overfished. And aquaculture culture is also a part of a densification strategy where you use empty uh, voids in the city to produce food. Um, so this is the strange part. Uh, this is a, a, a team of, of religious leaders. The guy with the church tower in the head is, is the uh, church father of the, the Christian church. He's the former bishop of Göteborg, Karl Axel Aurelius. You all know him. And to the right is the rabbi of, of Göteborg at the time. He's the Jewish leader. And to the right, it's an imam. He's a, a Muslim leader. And, and these guys asked me if we could team up and start working with urban agriculture as a way to integrate old folks with young folks, uh, people with education with those without and so on, and newcomers with old Swedes. And for me, the very most natural thing in order to, to, to go down the road with this group in my steering group, it was to... Uh, start working in a Swedish church. There's a lot of church land. And what's more natural, this is Höxbo, and it's all empty and it's sort of a bullshit area or a dog uh, area. Uh, used for nothing, good for nothing. So what's more natural than introducing pigs? So that's what we did. And I didn't understand that when we proposed pigs, well, the bishop, he thought it was a very stupid idea because the imam and the rabbi, but the rabbi and imam, they were really happy. They say that this, we, we long for the pigs, so bring them on. And, but I didn't understand that these were the first pigs in urban Göteborg since World War II. So it was really a way to, not, to introduce a new, old, new 
theme in Göteborg. But the politicians, they were really scared and the civil servants, they were really scared. They thought that the ship would sink, everybody would get sick and the Porsches of Höxbo would be trampled down by crazy pigs and pit bulls would be eaten and, and children and you know all that. But people just loved it. And the prices of the apartments in Höxbo, they went up. So in Höxbo, in GP, you know, the Göteborg Posten, there were ads. Uh, I'm selling my apartment in Höxbo. I can smell the pigs from my balcony. So this added to a market evaluation of the place. So if you bring some dirt, some food, some real life into the city, market will respond like that. And, and here, we, I kidnapped 13 uh, kindergarten kids and three daycare uh, teachers, and they all had ukuleles, and they were playing lit, Lille Gris, Lille Gris, Lille Söt, you know, Astrid Lindgren, in order to bring some people to the event where we released the pigs. But when we came, there were four film crews, and Svenska Dagbladet, and Technical Museums, and 400 people, and the bloggers just went crazy. So it's a sweet spot when you bring food. And so these are the pigs blessed by the imam and the rabbi and the bishop and everybody else. And we kill them and we eat them. And what they do is they convert uh, urban waste into good food and into participation and cooperation and understanding of food system and the importance of having food production close to you. Uh, so it's not sort of an event, it's really about doing good stuff. And here's a picture of a former minister of Sweden, and you can tell I'm talking about urban agriculture as a way to inspire urban areas, but also a way to, to uh, present rural methods. Because urban people, they are not bad at heart or stupid, they are just super ignorant. So in order to preserve our food production systems in the rural areas, we must bring some knowledge into the city. And you see, this is the Minister of Rural Affairs. He's super inspired. <laughs> he looks like he's going into a coma any, any minute. And I was angry, but now we are friends because some parts just stuck to him anyway. Uh, and other ministers, this is the Minister of Housing Affairs, and this, that's the governor. And the governor killed pigs, and, and 180 people ate our pigs at his 60th birthday. But now we're moving to, this is part of work in, in the, in the EU, uh, for the EU Parliament. Now we talk about fish. In 2009, I said that pigs are omnivores, they eat everything. Soon we introduce water-living pigs in Göteborg, and here they are soon. Why grow fish? Why present fish protein instead of land animal protein? Because fish is very good for you. And, and this is, everybody agrees, fish is good. Problem is that fish is often contaminated because the seas and the <laughs> lakes and the streams are contaminated by human activity. We have all these uh, doctors and all these universities and all these Chalmers, and they are pretty happy, but altogether we have presented waterways and water environments that make the fish toxic. And nobody wants to, you know, take responsibility for it, and now it's left for us to do something about it. Fish should be nutritious and good, but sometimes it's toxic, so then that's one of, of our actually possibilities and missions. More important is that fish is extremely efficient when it comes to metabolical uh, prestanda. So all these animals, they can eat waste from the city, so we don't have to overfish the oceans. And if you give 100 kilo of food from city waste to a fish, you get 85 to 100 kilos of fish body, and there's a lot to eat on a fish. And if you are Chinese, you eat everything. But we take away some, some parts of it. But a lot to eat. If you put 100 kilo uh, food from food waste to a chicken, you get 35 to 60 kilo chicken and you take a lot away a lot. If you give it to the pig, my favorite, you get 20, 25 kilos of pig and there's a lot not eaten. It's about metabolic efficiency. So that's why we should leave land animals and go aquatic animals if we want to eat uh, animal uh, protein. Here's a, I've been making a living uh, building systems for eco-labeling. Eco-labeling is good, but now I'm, I'm, I'm telling you why I'm going to 
give the money back. So I developed the Nor first Nordic system for eco-labeling, and uh, uh, shrimps from the West Coast were the first presented. And 2009 something happened, because the global uh, systems for eco-labeling, Marine Stewardship Council, I was working for CEDA in Southeast Asia, that's my main ocean uh, report uh, view. 2009, uh, MSC, Marine Stewardship Council, eco-labeled the first uh, Norwegian lobster, it's this one. And we fish in Sweden, we fish a Norwegian lobster two ways, with pots using 1.5 till 2 liters of diesel per kilo landed uh, lobster, and we trawl. So we destroy the bottom floor of the ocean and we use seven till nine liters of diesel. MSC choose to um, eco-label this one, the trawled, because they don't give a uh, about the environmental aspect uh, that has to do with uh, climate. Nothing. They skip that part in order to make more money to the organization. I'm very cruel about this. So we are told by nice people, too bad you can't be eco-labeled. And I say, I don't want to be eco-labeled. It's a stigma. I don't want to be there. We are here. So you see, but we cannot be eco-labeled. So we are beyond organic. 90% uh, of the world's large predators are overfished. And still, Western food culture claims that everybody around the world should eat large predators. And this is a food war going on. So you see, aquaculture, much bigger than capture fisheries. 93% is China and Asia. Only 1.6% is North America, 1% is Africa. And now Western countries try to claim and push uh, Western and Norwegian food culture into Asia. This is not good. I'm not going to moralize, I'm just going to say it's not good. So what we do instead of overfishing oceans and making aquaculture grow by feeding fish with overfished oceans, little fish, and we say this is just trash fish, but it's not trash for the Lunnefogel and for the Silgris, sorry, don't know the names, and for all the whales and for all the otters and for all the dolphins. It's not waste for them. So here, I knock on the door at an empty factory in Göteborg and I said, can I use some of the empty space? So in 50 square meters, I build a system, 50 square meters producing uh, two tons of fish every year. No antibiotics and no shadow on ocean and no shadow on, on external biological systems uh, at the cost of almost nothing. And when I do that, two tons, I get nutrients for 20 tons of, of, of vegetables. So, so instead of putting the waste water in the ocean, I make this. So I grow 100 kilos of greens in Slaktus at Göteborg today per square meter a year. That's a lot of greens. And now we focus how to conceptualize this. So this is a, a house. It's presented by Inubi, good uh, uh, designers in Göteborg together with me. 100 people living here. And this is one of the houses that is going to be built answering to the huge demand of new housing. So, normally when you build a house like this, you have a pizzeria, you have a cafe latte, you have a Gucci shop, but this is Uppsala, so it's not Gucci, it's Veskman. We take away Veskman and doof, we enter a Quartierfisk 50 square module for presenting fish. And we produce all the fish for 100 persons. And with 100 meter vertical farming greens, we produce all the greens for a house for 100. So with 10% of the classroom area in Göteborg, Stockholm, or Westeros, or Düsseldorf, we present all the fish needed by these cities. So urban farming, it's not some, you know, palikrage, 80 times 120 with a happy person say, oh, look, I have a carrot, it's three centimeters long. So we can present food models to really, real food models. So. Instead of taking food from the ocean, we make food from city waste. So this is our super mix. It's uh, one third greens from the uh, anywhere, uh, insects from brewery waste, and fish waste from Oudskroken. Not the poisonous ones, but the good ones. 
So you see, this is superfood for humans, but that is forbidden in Sweden. So it's superfood for, for dogs and for cats. And it's Tenobrium molitor, very nice one. Someone has been eating them? Yeah, there's, of course, that guy. I know him, and yeah, you guys, I believe so. Yeah, good food. So is it good for the fish? Yes, they like it a lot. Did I make a doctor's thesis on this? No, I did not. But I didn't do that on Schöttbullar either, and I'm still going to be 105 years old. I mean, it's not rocket science to make food for a fish. Can you eat these monsters? They grow 10 times faster than a perch. 10 times faster than a perch on city waste. Can you eat them? Uh, this is just a hint. This is Småland's only Gid Michelin restaurant, and they serve our fish since two and a half years back. Uh, another hint. I'm presenting this uh, future protein for 400 people, and this is the CEO of Livsmedelsverket, food authority. And this is a guy interested in food. His name is Tarek Taylor. He likes it. Um, this is very special for Sweden at the moment. We have a government that says we're going to build fish farms in our new houses. And we're talking about 200,000 new green blue jobs. And it's not only us doing this. This is the most expensive parts of, the, of, of, of Sweden today. Medrock, Vingård, Norma, the best restaurant in the world, and us. Start building in 2020, 10 houses, and that's going to be very, very high level of self-sufficiency in the city. I think I'm, you're throwing me out pretty soon. See what happens. Uh, we are asked now to present food models for the largest refugee camp in the world. And this is about saving people, and it's about saving oceans. NASA, they hang around in Slaktus at Göteborg, developing systems that works on Mars in Dadab, and in Göteborg and in Düsseldorf. Uh, sorry for taking some extra seconds there. I'm glad you didn't throw me out brutally. Uh, no questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.